Well, let me bring greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus, who is the head of the church. And let me say that if I'm one of your favorite four pastors, then y'all need to get to know a few more pastors. Um, I still feel it a privilege, though, to, to be back again with you guys, third time preaching on a Sunday here, and then also have been at your men's retreat to see amazing things happening in this congregation. And so I feel really, really blessed to be able to open God's word and address his people this morning. What we have in front of us, we're going to look at Mark chapter 14. So if you have a Bible, uh, turn there to Mark chapter 14. And, and you'll see that we, we have a wonderful but yet a heavy text in front of us this morning. And so my prayer for those of you that are in Christ, that know Christ, that you would be edified by the Savior this morning, that you would be encouraged by his faithful witness and be, by being encouraged by his faithful witness, that you would in turn be a faithful witness and then my prayer for you in this room is if you are just kind of checking out Jesus, checking out the church, is that you would see clearly who Jesus is this morning and see clearly what Jesus has done on behalf of even those people that would deny that they know him. And so I pray that you will be drawn to the Savior as well. So let me read the text. We're, we're going to focus in on verses 53 through 72. We're going to look at Jesus before the Sanhedrin and then Peter's denying of Jesus. But I want to set the context a little bit. So I'm going to read starting in verse 32 through 42, and then I'll read the text that we'll focus in on this morning. Here's what our brother Mark writes as he's moved by the Spirit. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he again went away and prayed, saying the same words. And he, again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came to them a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And then as they turn him over to the Sanhedrin, verse 53. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say that he will destroy the temple that is made with hands, and in three days he will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you are also with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke on a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, 
Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let's pray. Father, now, as we look into the book, I ask that you would have mercy upon me, a sinner. Father, that by your mercy, you would allow me to accurately and faithfully preach this text. Father, for us to behold here in the riches of your scripture what we need for life and for godliness. And so, Father, I pray for the help of the Spirit, that you would help me to preach faithfully for the good of your people. And, Father, I pray and ask that you would have mercy on the hearers in this room. Father, they would be able to receive the word today like they would receive bread. Father, I pray that by seeing Jesus high and lifted up, that we would be come more like him. Father, as we think about the day when we see him for how he truly is, give us just a glimpse today so that we're conformed more into his image. So help us, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. So fear is a part of everyday life. We face fear on a regular basis. When I was at the men's retreat, I talked about how when I was in high school, there was a popular line of t-shirts called No Fear t-shirts. No Fear was written really big on the t-shirt, and then it had some slogan underneath it like, Fear does not exist in this dojo or something like that. And I have to admit that when I was a middle schooler and I was wearing a No Fear t-shirt, I felt pretty special. I felt like what's talked about in that baseball classic Sandlot When I wore the No Fear t-shirt, I was walking a little taller that day. I thought I was a little bit tougher. Well, here in the text, we come to a a text that is all about fear and lack of fear. All about the things in this life that would make us fearful and looking at a man who, in the face of something that would bring persecution himself, was not fearful. And this all swirls around the topic of being a faithful witness in this world who will be a faithful witness to the truth here is the context that we look at in the gospel of mark we just read it the hour has come the time has come for how we will see jesus put on trial we will see him taken to galgotha we will see him crucified outside the camp the hour has come and he has been delivered over into the hands of his enemies and what we're going to see in this text is we consider what the savior has done on behalf of sinners, or as we consider the depths of his love for sinners, we come face to face with the reality that his suffering was not only physical, but his suffering was also relational. His suffering was mental, and most of all, his suffering was spiritual, yet it was all part of God's plan to redeem the world. Mark now will draw our attention to two different trials in this text. One of the trials will be the most unjust trial the world has ever seen as Jesus will be put on trial before the Sanhedrin. When I was a kid, whenever I would complain to my dad, that's not fair, my dad would always respond, life's not fair. There's hardly a better example in the world of life not being fair than what we will see here with Jesus being on trial. And the second trial will be below in the courtyard. It will be Peter as he is on trial, not a formal trial, but as he is being pressed about the truth. And we will see that in both trials there are witnesses and there are confessions, but these two trials could not be more different. Mark will draw our attention now to the theme of being a faithful witness. As seven times in nine verses, there will be some various form of the word witness. And what we will behold in these verses will be at one point horrifying, even violent. And yet, on the other hand, we will see something that's strikingly beautiful. One commentator speaking of this text says, we now see the lion of the tribe of Judah becoming the lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. All of this as we move one step closer to that hill called Calvary. And so I've basically broken it down into two points. First point in verses 53 through 65, see the faithful witness. And in verses 66 through 72, we will see the unfaithful witness. Here's what the text says. And they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself by the fire. So here's the scene. Shortly before daybreak on Good Friday, this mob who has come and arrested Jesus, who had been led by Judas to arrest him, take him before what is called the Sanhedrin. That's this group of men that is talked about here in the text. 
The Sanhedrin was a group of 71 men. It included the high priest. And then it had three different groups that made up the Sanhedrin. You see the chief priest, that's mainly the Sadducees. Secondly, you have the elders, and that's mainly the Pharisees. And then the third group is the scribes, or those who are the teachers of the law. And so what you have here is the Sanhedrin, the most powerful uh, authority in the land of Israel. They would report to Rome now, now that Rome had taken over most of the world, but they were now the highest level of authority in Israel, and they are now putting on trial this one they consider to be the troubler of Israel. It's interesting, only Rome at this point, because Rome has power over Palestine, only Rome has the power to make a capital punishment uh, charge against someone, and we will see that they will still move forward with a capital punishment, even though they are not supposed to. And Peter is now following at a distance, Jesus. Matthew's gospel, in his account, he says that Jesus is following him to see what he thinks will be the end. And he stays below in the high priest's courtyard while Jesus is up in the upper room being put on trial. Essentially, you would have this house that had an opening where you could see into the top room. Down below, you would have uh, this courtyard, and that's where Peter's hanging out, warming himself. He can see fully what's about to take place as he sits there in the courtyard. Now, this, the, the wording here, the fact that he followed him at a distance should be alarming to us. It should be alarming that Peter is following him at a distance. Just merely a few hours before this, Peter had told Jesus that even if he had to die with Jesus, he would be willing to die. And now he sits at a safe distance to observe the trial of the man he says he loves. One scholar said it like this, Peter has now forsaken costly discipleship for safe observation. Now the trial begins in verse 56. The chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness saying, against him saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify, testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. This farce trial now begins. And we know it's a farce from the very beginning because of the words they were seeking testimony against him to put him to death. In, in a sense, they already had the verdict they wanted. He's, he's worthy of death. And now they go in search of some evidence to back up their verdict. Mark is letting the reader know that at every turn, this is a kangaroo court that has been trumped up to try to bring charges against Jesus. And in great irony, many come forward and bear false witness. This too should be alarming because bearing false witness is one of the Ten Commandments that is most treasured and most precious to the, the nation of Israel. They are not to bear false witness, talk, talked about in the Ten Commandments. And yet here, many come forward bearing false witness because of Jesus. And even about this false witness, their testimony will not agree. This group of men who were to uphold the law in the land should have been outraged at this violation of the Ten Commandments. But instead, they so want to put Jesus to death that they will ignore the fact that there are men coming forward violating the 10 most precious laws that they have. Now, they center in here on one specific charge, one false charge brought against Jesus, that being that he said he would destroy the temple. Now, this is a serious charge. If somebody actually came forward and said they would destroy the temple, it would be a serious charge because the temple was their center, not just for religion. The temple was the central part of their life. In fact, we don't have anything in American culture to, to even compare this to. It would be something close to somebody coming into our country and saying, I'm going to burn all your Bibles and I'm going to blow up the White House. That would be as close as we could get to how serious it would be if someone said they were going to take the temple out. So this is serious, and in their law, if it had been up to them and not Rome, it demanded capital punishment. The problem is that though Jesus said something similar, he did not actually say he would destroy the temple. He did say in John 2, he likened his body to the temple and said, you will tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. And he did say in Mark chapter 13, as he was teaching about judgment, he did say one day the temple would be destroyed, but he did not say he would be the one who would destroy it. But unlike American culture, Jesus here is guilty until proven innocent. But even on this, their testimony does not agree. In every generation, there is attempts to discredit Jesus, beginning here in the first century. 
And Mark is going to great lengths to show you that Jesus cannot be discredited. Now the high priest is irritated at what is going on, that nothing is, as it were, sticking to Jesus. And so he takes matters into his own hand and directly questions Jesus. And he's frustrated that Jesus won't speak. The high priest stood up in their midst and says, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And Jesus remained silent, fulfilling a prophecy that was given about him 700 years before by the prophet Isaiah, which said this, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This whole thing is a farce at every turn. At every turn, almost every detail in this text violates G Jewish legal procedures as prescribed in their writings. Here are just four things that it violates. Jesus is never given a defense attorney, as would have been mandated and expected of anybody who was on trial. Interestingly, for those of us who know what Jesus is called in 1 Timothy, the one who is the true mediator between God and man would be given no mediator in this moment. Capital trials were supposed to take place over two days. They so did not want to put somebody to death unfairly that each judge was supposed to sleep on the verdict and come back again and deliver it a second day so that they would not execute somebody too quickly. And yet this doesn't even take place over one evening. The trial didn't take place at the temple precincts as it was supposed to. Instead, it takes place at the high priest's house. And the fact that their eyewitnesses contradicted, contradicted each other should have immediately had the trial thrown out. It was demanded by their law that in a capital case, there had to be at least two witnesses that agreed again on the charge against the one to be executed. Because again, they wanted to be so careful not to execute somebody unlawfully. They so badly wanted this man dead that at every turn they short-circuited their own law in order to expedite his execution. Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that something similar would happen to Jesus' brother James when he would be executed. And so the question must come to us, why would they so badly want this man dead? Well, it's true, he threatens their way of life. He threatens their authority. He threatens their status and position. These are the most powerful men in Israel. If what he says is true, it will shake up their world. He indeed is a radical threat to their way of life. But he is a radical threat to their way of life for their good and not for their ill. He has come to make the temple obsolete. He has come to show the world that there is going to be something that even provides greater access to God than the temple himself. God in flesh. He has come to show them that the temple sacrifices could not give them a final sacrifice that would take care of their sins. That he has come as an even greater sacrifice than the sacrifices in the temple to provide full forgiveness for all time. They miss what kind of Messiah Jesus is and they miss what kind of Messiah they need. And the question is, do we? Now the high priest takes on the role of pros prosecutor with a direct question in verse 61. Matthew tells us that he asks this question of Jesus and puts him under oath. And here's what he says. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? This is the question that if you study through the gospel of Mark, this is the question that the whole gospel of Mark is asking. And now it is asked by the high priest. Are you the son of God? Blessed they just use simply as a way to talk about God because they did not want to use the word Yahweh. They did not want to call God by his real name. And thankfully in the text, Jesus is silent no longer. As he will be the faithful witness in the face of persecution. Let's feel the force and the weight of his answer. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. Jesus now, if you know your Bibles, in unambiguous terms, with a clear answer, compares himself to the God who had spoken to Moses in the burning bush. Are you the son of God? I am. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He continues. You will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. 
Not only does he connect himself to the God that revealed himself in Exodus chapter 3, he now compares himself to the Son of Man talked about in Daniel chapter 7 and to the King who is talked about in Psalm 110, saying that he is the one who ultimately will be given all dominion and all power. This is striking because up until this point, Jesus has, for the most part, shied away from telling people who he is. We call it in the Gospel of Mark the Messianic secret. For the most part, he tells people, even when he reveals that he is the Son of God, go and tell no one. And now in this moment, he lifts the veil on the Messianic secret, saying clearly that who he is. But not only is he revealing that he is the, the Messiah that is to come, he turns around and says to this This pool of watching judges, he gives them a holy warning that he will return in judgment in the future by appealing to Daniel chapter 7 and Psalm 110. He is informing them that though they sit in judgment over him right now, that there is a day coming when you will not stand in judgment over me. There is a day coming when I will stand in judgment over you. And have you ever imagined what it will be like in judgment when Caiaphas sees Jesus for the first time? Up until this moment, Jesus has, for the most part, wisely veiled his identity. He did this because he knew that Israel was expecting the wrong kind of Messiah. They were expecting the kind of Messiah that would overthrow Rome. They had missed the fact that Isaiah 53 says that it's necessary for the Christ to suffer. And the mystery throughout the book of Mark has been this. Who is this man that teaches with authority? Who is this man that can calm the storms? And the tension has built to this moment in the gospel of Mark, but it remains a mystery no longer. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. So why does Jesus lift the veil now? It's simple. The hour has come for him to drink the cup of God's wrath on behalf of sinners. He has not come to overthrow Rome. He has come to offer his life as a ransom for many. And he boldly states this knowing full well that this response will bring him death. One theologian says, this audacious claim guarantees his execution. And we should be thankful because our eternal destiny hangs in the balance. Revelation 1 calls Jesus the faithful witness And this is so because he tells the truth regardless of the consequences, and he does that for you and for me. He lays down his life as a ransom for many. The high priest immediately sees this as blasphemy. Here's what the text says. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving of death. In an act of horror, he tears his robe. This was common in their day that when somebody, there's something happened that was shocking or horrifying, they would tear their clothes. I couldn't help but think about, if you watched the Olympics last summer, when the, the Mongolian wrestling coaches were upset that their guy got cheated, they started taking their clothes off as a sign of, of horror against the judge's decision. That is what's going on here. They are horrified at what Jesus has said, and so he's tearing his garments. And it says, the rest of the Sanhedrin follows his lead in condemning Jesus as worthy of death. Sadly, in the text, they gave no attention to whether Jesus was actually telling the truth. This was considered blasphemy because he claimed to have the majesty and authority that God alone can have. But it's only blasphemy if it's not true. It's popular, some in our day, for some, some of those who study the Bible, I wouldn't call them Christians, but to say that God, that Jesus never claimed to be divine, he never claimed to be God. Men like Bart Ehrman at the University of North Carolina make this claim. When you see what happens in the text, when you see the way the judges respond to what has happened, there is no doubt these men know exactly what Jesus is claiming to be. There is no confusion here. He is making it clear. God has arrived in the flesh. Now things in the text move from not just being unjust, they move to being quite shameful. As their anger against this man will no longer be restrained. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. When I studied this text, it was really hard to do. I'm just trying to put myself in this place to understand what is going on. 
as we consider what he has endured on behalf of sinners like us. They spit on him. When I was a kid, I used to think that those spitting on him were the guards. But it's actually the, the judges that are spitting upon him. It is those who are called to be the shepherds of Israel, to be the leaders of Israel. And now, in an act that was just as gross in their day, in our day, it is just as gross in our day as they spit on him. Just one of the things that he's endured for sinners. I got in one fight in middle school. I was actually on a bus leaving Cherryville, North Carolina. We had played in an all-star baseball tournament, and a kid on my team spit on me in the van, and I just immediately started punching him. And I'm just reminded when I look at texts like this that when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile in return. It's just one of the things that he's endured. They blindfold him and they start to punch him in the face. Once again, our Lord returns to silence as they mock him. This is quite unbecoming behavior of the judges of Israel. Can you imagine this scene in one of our courtrooms? Can you imagine a judge in his robe as he pronounces a guilty verdict on somebody punching him in the face and spitting upon him? The guards now follow at the very end there, verse 65, the guards follow in the very same steps of abuse that they have observed in their leaders as they receive him with fists. This man who had healed the sick, this man who had helped the poor, this man who was kind and loving, they now receive by punching him in the face. What a miscarriage of justice at every turn. And it's only getting started. When you think about what's happening here in the text, you see the ugliness of sin. The human heart, the wickedness of the human heart is on full display. But thankfully, we also see the love of God for sinners in this text. Because we understand that the cross and everything that led up to the cross was necessary. It was necessary for our Christ to be rejected. It was necessary for him to be condemned, for him to be killed, so that we would not have to be. Oh, the fact that he would be stricken, smitten, and afflicted in your place. All of this predicted 700 years before it would actually happen. Here's what Isaiah 50 verse 6 says. I gave my back to those who strike in my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Strangely enough, in the text, after all the false testimonies, the very testimony that's going to get him beaten, mocked, and ultimately killed is his own testimony that leads to his execution. Let's see the faithful witness. And then finally, let's see the unfaithful witness. Here's what the text says. And as Peter was below in the court courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also are with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. Now below in the courtyard, a different kind of trial is taking place. Jesus is being tried uh, above by the leaders of Israel. And now below Peter will undergo examination at the hands of a servant girl. Sometimes in our day, we say things like, I've got your back, or I'd take a bullet for you. And just a few hours before, Peter had pledged this sort of love and this sort of devotion to his friend, and then along comes a little girl. Now put yourself in Peter's shoes. Here is a man that you have left everything to follow. You've placed all your hope in this man. And he's up above you getting punched in the face and being spit upon and you have a chance to be a faithful friend but Jesus as we will see Peter does not have Jesus' back seemingly fearful for his life he denies knowing Jesus he essentially says in the text something we might say today like I have no idea what you're talking about the sort of thing I used to say when I would take cookies when I wasn't supposed to and my mom would challenged me and I would mumble, I have no idea what you're talking about, with chocolate still on my face. He plays dumb, 
And then in order to further remove himself from Jesus and the little girl, he walks to the gate. But the servant girl is persistent. Says this, and the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of him, is one of them. But he again denied it. She now directs others towards Peter as well. Again, he denies it. The verb tense in Greek indicates that he, to use common language, he went off in his denial. His, his denial intensified the second time. And then finally, we'll come to the third denial. Here's what the text says. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster and immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Several others chime in because they notice this man's accent, meaning that he must be a follower of Jesus. And I'm afraid if you're familiar with the story, if you've grown up in the church, you miss the gravity of what's happening here in this third denial. He's so he so wants to break from Jesus that not only does he deny him, he begins to swear and he begins to curse as the intensity of his denial grows all the more. Peter here uses the Greek word anathematize. What he is saying, he is literally saying, Lord, if I know this man, strike me down. This was tough to study as well. The man you love is being humiliated. And if you notice in the text, Peter doesn't just deny him. He won't even mention Jesus' name. What Judas did for profit, Peter did for free. How much has changed in less than four hours for Peter to go from, I will die for you if I have to, to not even mentioning Jesus' name in the face of a little girl? And this should be a warning to us, a question we should grapple with. Have you ever made promises to God that you walked out on during a time of fear for self-preservation? He's immediately confronted with his betrayal as the rooster crows a second time. He is drawn back to the moment when Jesus had predicted all of this would happen. Our brother Luke tells us in his account that at that moment, Jesus and Peter make eye contact with each other. And Peter breaks down and begins to weep. Have you ever had a moment when you were so overwhelmed by your sin and by your actions that you broke down? In many ways, the scene, the second trial is just as gut-wrenching to me as the one taking place above. And I've tried to put myself in Peter's shoes because none of us are above this. None of us are above in the place of fear, denying we know Jesus. The difference in these two trials could not be more stark, could not be more clearly highlighted. Just a couple of observations. Both are being questioned, but Jesus is being questioned by the most powerful men in the land, and he stands strong. While Peter is being questioned by a servant girl, and he cowers. Both were, are being charged with something that will get them in trouble. However, G, the charges against Jesus are false, while the charges against Peter are true. In a sense, Peter, Jesus is attacked by false witnesses, yet tells the truth. Peter is attacked by true witnesses and yet tells a lie. Both respond to the charges, however, Jesus declares the truth while Peter lies. Both are near guards, but Jesus tells the truth despite the consequences, while Peter denies the truth in order to avoid the consequences. Both bring a curse upon themselves. Though the curse on Jesus is unfair, while the curse on Peter, while the curse for Peter, he's, he actually brings it upon himself. One implication for us is that Peter, without ever facing a formal trial, denies to even know Jesus. This is a warning to us that faithful witness to Jesus can most often be found, and the denial of being a faithful witness to Jesus can most often be found, not when we're in a trial before the world to see, but can happen in the everyday. It can happen at the water cooler, as it were. So what kind of witness will you be? Let's not be too harsh on Peter. Any of us could walk in this path. 
My prayer is that you will determine now, though, before the heat hits, what kind of faithful witness you will be. And the only way we will have the power to do this is by setting our eyes on the faithful witness, the one who gives us both the power and the example to follow here. And so three concluding applications and we'll be done. Number one, there is forgiveness at the cross. The cross can silence our failures and our denials. It can silence our rightful condemnation. Though he never sinned, he was spat upon, mocked, murdered, condemned, so that we would not have to be. When you feel condemnation coming on, you don't look to your failures. You don't look to the rooster. Instead, you look to the cross where your righteousness is. We cannot come away from this text and not be overwhelmed that forgiveness is ours in Christ Jesus. Jesus ultimately drowned in his own blood for Peter's denial. And he did for your sins as well. See the grace that is ours in Christ, that we can be forgiven of our sins, of these kind of failures. Number two, let the substitutionary work of Christ make you a faithful witness. Only when you realize that forgiveness is possible because another took your place will you have the power you need to be a faithful witness. Because you will realize now condemnation cannot sit over you. This passage has everything to do with Christ's substitutionary work on behalf of sinners. Mark has beautifully shown that Jesus is on trial in Peter's place, in the leader's place, in our place. He would take the ultimate punishment, not for his sins, but for the sins of Peter and for our sins as well. In a sense, in this scene, God himself has put himself in the dock. Let humanity stand over him in judgment. He has willingly taken the place of humanity where Adam has sinned and where we have sinned, where we should have stood there under the wrath of God. God himself puts himself in that place and lets humanity bring down condemnation upon him. This is the greatest news in all the world. Jesus gets what we deserved and we get what Jesus deserved. As one pastor put it, Jesus became all that God must judge so that we by faith in him could become all that God cannot. You should marvel at the work of Christ on your behalf, believer. You should let it increase your affections for him and make you a more faithful witness. If you're in this room and you're an unbeliever, the message we want you to hear is that one day Jesus will come on the clouds. He will come bringing judgment. And those in this world that are found outside of Christ, those who have not fled to Christ as the mediator, those will be wiped away in his judgment. But there is mercy and grace available. If you will fall down like that tax collector in the gospels and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Jesus says, that's the sort of man that goes to his house justified. And final application, let's let the resurrection make us a fearful, a fearless witness. It would not help us to leave Peter's story here. When I used to ride around in the car with my dad, we listened to a radio show by Paul Harvey called The Rest of the Story. And we need to hear the rest of Peter's story. Something radically changes for Peter. So much so that in about 50 days, 50 days from now, he will be back in front of the Sanhedrin. This time, ironically, he's back in front of the Sanhedrin for speaking about the name of Jesus. The name that he wouldn't even mention here in this text, he's now on trial again. What changed for Peter in those 50 days? Jesus isn't dead anymore. The end of Peter's story is not his collapse. Jesus would go before him to Galilee. Jesus would meet with him. Jesus would restore him to the point that even we in this room have been beneficiaries of Peter's witness in the world. Jesus in his grace will not let Peter be defined by his past. Everything changed for Peter after the resurrection. Ironically, the very things he's afraid of in this text, arrest, beatings, crucifixion, he would later willingly face. Tradition tells us Peter would die the martyr's death. One of the pastors in Rome, a guy named Clement in the second century said this, let us take the noble examples of our generation through jealousy and envy, the greatest and most just pillars of the church were persecuted and came even unto death. Peter, through unjust envy, endured not one or two, but many labors. And at last, having delivered his testimony, departed unto the place of glory due him. And legend has it that Peter was crucified upside down because he did not find himself worthy to be crucified in the same way that his Lord had been crucified. What changed for this man? Well, let me ask you a question. What if a man that you loved, that you left everything to follow, What if he was arrested and he was humiliated 
and he was murdered, and he was thrown away in a grave to rot. And what if three days later you ate fish with him? Would that change your view of death? Would that change your view of life? Jesus, though he is unjustly condemned here, he is later vindicated by the Father as on the third day he walks out of a Palestinian tomb alive. And the promise he gives to those that are in Christ is that death will not ultimately touch them as well. We see in the resurrection with eyes of faith that, that even if we have been killed in this world, God raises dead bodies to life. Even if we were before Islamic jihadists who would cut our head off, that's okay. Jesus puts heads back on. There's a long line of saints who have stared down death and resolved to be faithful witnesses. As I was studying this text, I read about the 288 English Protestants who were killed by the Queen Mary, who was called Bloody Mary. Famously, one of those English Protestants named Hugh Latimer, as he was being burned at the stake, turns to his other friend Ridley, who's also being burned, and he says, be of good cheer, Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light up such a candle in England as I trust will never be put out. And a couple days later, John Bradford, as he's being burned at the stake, turns to his friend John Leaf and says, Be of good comfort, my brother, for we will have a merry supper with the Lord tonight. And both are said to have lifted their hands in the air as, and prayed as they were burning. So what kind of witness will you be, Christian? The good news for the believers is there is forgiveness for our failures, even for Peter type collapses. Oh, what it must have been like in Galilee when Jesus embraced Peter for the first time. There is power in the work of Christ to make us faithful in this life. Oh, be of good cheer and be of good comfort, brothers and sisters. Soon we will have a merry supper with the Lord. No fear. And let's turn for a foretaste of that supper in the Lord's table. Father, thank you for your word. We're thankful for the work of our Savior. Thank you that when we are faithless, he is faithful. Father, we're thankful there's forgiveness at the cross. And Father, we're thankful for the truth of the resurrection. May we see it with eyes of faith. May it make us bold in this life. May it make us understand that death for us is only the beginning of something greater. So glorify yourself in us, we pray. Amen.